Ciao. One. Uh, so there's this thing that uh, I don't know. How good are you at spotting celebrities? Um, I live in New York City, so I'm going to say not that. Oh, I mean, actually, I'm going to refer. I was going to say not that great, but mm-hmm. actually, I I'm not bad at it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's usually like my wife will be like, "Who's that? Like, is that somebody?" <laughs> and I'm like, yes. Yeah. No. Like, where do we know them from? And I, I can usually figure it out. But I'm not. I'm not looking that hard. I. My favorite celebrity encounter uh, was years ago during uh, the the broadcast run of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, hmm. when um, uh, the actor who played the mayor in season three and oh, his yeah, name yeah, is yeah yeah I know who you're talking Bye. about. He was also on uh, the TV show Dear John. He was, and he he had a small role, but a small but interesting role in the West Wing, where he played the Secretary of Agriculture. Yes, um, he was the designated survivor. He was the designated survivor. Um, uh, anyway, it was the, uh, Harry Groner. That's his okay. Name. Okay. Um, it, and the season finale of season three of Buffy was delayed, along with a, a mid-season episode called Earshot, both both because of Columbine, because they featured scenes of teenagers with weapons. And both of them were were not shown in sequence during the season. They were postponed to the summer. Hmm. So nobody had seen, like you'd seen part one of the finale, but part two had not aired yet. And the day part two was set to air, I went to the allergist and in walks the mayor, Harry Groner, (laughs) who apparently had the same allergist. Okay. And I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. And I I never do this. I never do this. But I had a copy of the New York Times, which had a a review of the finale. And I went up to him in the waiting room. I said, "Uh, Mr. Groner, I'm so sorry to bother you while you're waiting to get your allergy shot. Um, But I have to tell you, big fan. I love what you've done this season. You really did. Like, as this villain, you've done amazing work. And would you mind autographing this for me? And he was so gracious. He's like, oh, yeah, you know, really curious how you're going to like it. And he was, he was just, he was very, very thoughtful and kind. Hmm. Came home that night, met up with my my fa- my wife and our friends who we watched the show with. I was like, "You're not going to believe what I have here in my bag." I was so excited. So yeah, sometimes you do run into celebrities in New York City. That was yeah. a weird, one. It was very it's a, strange. It's actually kind of a weird question to say, "How are you at spotting celebrities?" Because you wouldn't really know, would you? No, you like yeah. maybe they're just well. But I, that's the thing about <laughs> if you live in New York and you right. are out and about. Yeah. You'll find out if you're good at spotting celebrities because someone yeah. will point them out to you if you miss them. Yeah. And it, there's enough of a hit rate that you'll find out. So yeah, I can I'm I'm not bad at it. I don't like I'm not I I'm not particularly face blind or, or have trouble recognizing right. people. So I can if I see somebody and I I saw um uh one of the actresses from Billions uh on the subway. All right. Not, yeah, you don't have to tell me it's fine because I, yeah. I know nobody from that show except for Paul Giamatti. Yeah. He's on that, right? He is on that. That's yeah, and that guy who was in Homeland, whose name I don't know, and that's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I don't need to. The whole reason I asked is because I saw Jackie Mason sitting outside a restaurant one time. Wow. He had brought his show to Boston, and I was still living in Boston at the time. And he was—I was down on Newberry Street. Don't know why. I think he was in front of Sansi, but you know, whatever. And for people who know Boston. Yes, I love Sansi. I know it's a place for posers, but I don't care. I'm happy to go there and pose because it was just, you know, to me it was like, it was like going to the Brown Derby, but different. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell more stories about something else some other time if you want to. But let us move on because we actually have, uh, we have Apple stuff to talk about. We have news to talk about. I want you to tell me everything you know about Pegasus. <laughs> sort of my con it's thing. Like yeah, but it's a Genesis thing. See, but it's Pegasus. Is what I was thinking. Um, so I, I assume people know because I know I did a lot about it on Mac OS Ken last week. I actually did, I think, a whole episode or half an episode of uh, the checklist about it as well. Um, this is the spyware used by the NSO group. No, I'm sorry, not used by the NSO group, made by the NSO group. In fact, the one thing they will tell you is they don't use it. They sure. find somebody they trust or somebody finds them and flashes them a lot of money. And they're like, yeah, we trust them. And so then they sell this spyware to those people, and those people use that spyware to target, uh, you know, criminals and terrorists and activists against whatever regime and journalists, because, you know, they know things and you want to know the things that they know. 
and it sort of seems like a like a like a less than fun thing. <laughs> now, yeah, on a lot of levels. Okay, do you want to fill people in a bit more than that? Because what I kind of having talked about it on a couple of different shows, just about the nuts and bolts of it, I'm kind of curious to talk about the Apple side of it. Mm-hmm. But is there anything else you want to uh, clue people into before we move on from that? Well, uh, I mean, there's there's some incredible coverage coming out now. So the 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 it, the interesting thing there's so many interesting things about this story. One of them is that this list of phone numbers fifty thousand uh, fifty thousand phone numbers. It's it's not entirely clear how congruent that is with um, any sort of representation of the targets of the pegasus spyware right. so pegasus pegasus is um when it is used to attack a mobile device is either it's sent as a text message or or an image or um in in apparently in many cases leveraging vulnerabilities that do not require actually user interaction at all which is super scary right um but it is definitely it is definitely attacking both iphones and android phones I think one of the interesting things about the coverage is that when it attacks an Android phone, there's basically very little forensic evidence that it was there. Mm-hmm. So you're hearing things like, well, we discovered we discovered evidence of Pegasus being on you know, 37 phones that were all iPhones. Well, the mm-hmm. reason those were all iPhones is because if it hits Android, you're never going to know. Um, so there's not there's not really a reason to believe that that iPhones are more susceptible and in fact probably the opposite. Right. But it's clear that there are these these vulnerabilities, these zero days or these these exploits that are being used on on both platforms mm-hmm. to get access to the devices. But what's not clear is how much of that list represents real targets. What is apparent from the from the work that uh, the Washington Post, the New York Times and other other journalists have been able to do with this list is that there are examples of a phone number shows up on the list with a timestamp within a matter of minutes or even seconds. There is evidence of Pegasus being either attempted to be installed on the phone or actually being installed on the phone. So there's something going on. And NSO, which is the company that makes us like this list is nothing, nothing to do with us. It's not about us. Like, mm, OK, yeah. They, and they, they're taking sort of a Werner von Braun approach. When, when the rockets go up, who cares where they come down? Yeah, it's not kind my of. Department, says yeah. Werner von Braun. But, but there's an amazing, I mean, tragic and upsetting, but kind of astonishing story on the Washington Post about this, uh, about Princess Latifa of Dubai, mm-hmm. uh, United Arab Emirates. And she had escaped her family in a daring, you know, uh, dinghy and water scooter and yacht trip, you know, trying to get away. Um, the yacht was overtaken by commandos from India and from the UAE. She was, you know, put in handcuffs and dragged back. Hmm. Uh, and you know, the, the, the sheik and her, her father said, Oh, she was kidnapped and we were rescuing her. But like it se- it's it seemed eminently clear that she was escaping. Mm-hmm. And numbers for her and her friends, people who were working to help her, all of those numbers were added to the list shortly after she went missing in February of 2018. The UAE was believed to have been a client of NSO and a user of Pegasus. It's not clear exactly what role Pegasus played in 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 the princess being captured mm-hmm. but it seems there's a very very strong and shocking coincidences if there's not in fact direct evidence that the ability to track her phone and other people's phones who were in communication with her helped lead that commando team to her location on the boat so the thing that keeps uh, catching in my mind and it's not this is not the most important part of the story by any stretch of the imagination, right? I mean, yeah. one of the people that I heard interviewed was uh, was the uh, former fiancé of Jamal Khashoggi. Mm-hmm. And the reason she's the former yeah. fiancé is because he was lured to his death. I mean, he went yes. into the 
Turkish consulate? Is that correct? No. What consulate did he go to in it Turkey? Was, it, it, is the, it was the Saudi consulate because he was trying right. to get um, – he needed he needed paperwork for his impending marriage. I don't know if right. it was a passport update or – but it was something he needed to get married. So he went to the, uh, the Saudi consulate and he never came out because he was killed there. And yep. and so – and then you tell the story uh, like about the princess and, and there are so many things – what I'm about to say is not the most important part of it. I've been bothered by the messaging around the Apple side. And the reason, of course, I concentrate on that is because I do Apple stuff. The interview that I saw with, um, uh, or heard, excuse me, with his uh, former fiance is mm-hmm. she said, I thought iPhone was safe. And the person yeah. who was, and the person who interviewed her said, well, that's what iPhone says. That's what the company that makes iPhone says, but it's not. And the problem is that then is going to be the thing that people hear and people remember. At the same time, Apple's immediate response was, no, 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 there's nothing to worry about. You're fine. And the thing is, I mean, to me, once you start parsing it a bit, it's kind of like, well, I'm fine in that I'm not going to be targeted. Right. But senators, congressmen, presidents, prime ministers, heads of corporations, People who can really seriously affect my life, not on an individual basis. I don't think Ron yep. Wyden is going to show up at my door yelling at me about anything, right? Right. I don't even think Ted Cruz will. And I put his picture up literally as a clown on Twitter so many times. <laughs> I feel certain that, you know, this does not have anything to do with me personally, except you've got, you know, some people sort of trying to put a lever under people of power and flip them or turn them different ways. And so for Apple to say, you're safe, it sort of feels like it's the same thing as saying, well, Apple says you're safe, but you're not. I mean, there, yeah. there are nuances there. And, and the problem that I have is everybody who comes at this story saying, well, you don't have to worry about it. Then, yeah. you know, then I think people might just roll over and go back to sleep or, you know, like hit snooze for five minutes. When, when the stuff that's happening, I mean, the fact that I personally am in no danger, but people who can really make life miserable for significant portions of the planet's population are in danger means we're all in danger. I, I think that's really that's really important and a very a very essential thing to capture, which is yes, am I likely to be the target of state actors who are interested in compromising my phone and turning on the camera on my phone so they can, you know, catch me scratching my backside right. uh, in my underwear? No, that seems unlikely. Um, but I mean, and, and I, I always have to mention the fact that my brother has a little miniature camera slide over his selfie camera on his phone. Mm-hmm. Um, and every time, every time something like this happens, he, reminds me that he is right and I am wrong. Um, but, <laughs> but I think your, your point there about where the, where the pressure points are, where the points of weakness are is essential because what we know is if somebody has a weak spot, if somebody can be compromised or influenced or blackmailed, not even, you know, not even kidnapped or, you know, the, the horrible, uh, things that are happening to the princesses or activists or human rights workers or, or other people, but even a, a senator or a governor or a mayor mm-hmm. who whose phone is targeted, the camera is turned on, the microphone is turned on, and suddenly somebody who you know wants to put a toxic waste dump next door to your house has that person in their pocket or can in exercise power in illegitimate and unseen ways over somebody who who then is going to ma- magnify that power or uh, or amplify that power in ways that are detrimental to the common good that you're absolutely right like that is that is what we need to worry about and it's not it, when Apple spent all this time talking about privacy and the do not track and the amount of pushback that 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 created that's important and that that constitutes a lot of voluntary surveillance that we're all sort of, we've all been sort of subjecting ourselves to. Mm -hmm. But the involuntary surveillance that is deliberately kept below the waterline and, and out of people's visibility, that is terribly corrosive to civic life. It's terribly corrosive to integrity and to people's motivations being transparent. And we know this, we've seen 
Like we've seen what happens when people in power can be compromised. So, yeah, you're right. It is a big problem. And and Apple's ability to have situational awareness around these zero days, these vulnerabilities and do the forensics that it's going to take to close them down. Like I get that there's value in a government having the ability to track terrorist phones. Mm -hmm. I'm not not disputing that there are legitimate law enforcement needs for something like this. But this is not that like this is the we are we are well out of uh, well out of the Pandora's box range blast radius here because this is this is being applied as as could have been easily predicted. This is being applied in ways that are entirely detrimental and have no legitimate purpose. Okay.